ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Lilly Q1 2024 earnings call. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode. Later, we will be conducting a question and answer session and instructions will be given at that time. Should you request operator assistance during the call, please press star then zero and an operator will assist you offline. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Joe Fletcher, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for Eli Lilly & Company's Q1 2024 earnings call. I'm Joe Fletcher, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. And joining me on today's call are Dave Ricks, Lilly's Chair and CEO, Anad Ashkenazi, Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Dan Skobronsky, Chief Scientific Officer and President of Lilly Immunology, Anne White, President of Lilly Neuroscience, Ilya Yufa, President of Lilly International, Jake Van Narden, President of Loxo at Lilly, and Patrick Johnson, President of Lilly Diabetes and Obesity and Lilly USA. We're also joined by Mike, uh, Michaela Irons, Mike Springnether, and Lauren Zerke of the IR team. During this conference call, we anticipate making projections and forward-looking statements based on our current expectations. Actual results could differ materially due to several factors, including those listed on slide two. Additional information concerning factors that could cause actual results to differ materially is contained in our latest Form 10-K and subsequent filings with the SEC. The information we provide about our products and pipeline is for the benefit of the investment community. It's not intended to be promotional and is not sufficient for prescribing decisions. As we transition to our prepared remarks, please note our commentary will focus on our non-GAAP financial measures. Now I'll turn the call over to Dave. Okay, thanks, Joe. We're pleased with our Q1 results and the continued momentum, momentum in our business, which positions us well for accelerated growth as this year progresses. Our focus is to bring innovative medicines to people in need. And in 2024, we're investing in our people, our launches, expanding our pipeline of new medicines, including through business development, and of course, accelerating the needed capacity in our manufacturing network. Results this quarter represent a continuation of the strong growth we delivered in 2023. On slide four, you can see details of the financial performance and progress related to our strategic deliverables. Revenue grew 26% in Q1, with our new products growing nearly $1.8 billion compared with the same period last year. We achieved several key pipeline milestones, including the positive phase three results for terzepatide in moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, the approval of our multi-dose quick pen delivery device for Manjaro in Europe, submission of mirakizumab in the US and in the EU for moderately to severely active Crohn's disease, the resubmission of lebrakizumab in the US for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and the initiation of our phase three study for lepidicerin, evaluating efficacy and reducing cardiovascular risk. Lilly's top priority is to ensure we execute on our ambitious manufacturing expansion agenda. We recently signed an agreement to acquire an injectable medicine facility from Nexus Pharmaceuticals in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. This state-of-the-art facility has been FDA approved and we are targeting uh, to initiate production at the end of 2025. We broke uh, ground earlier this month on our previously announced parenteral manufacturing site in Germany. And in existing facilities, we are working to maximize output and productivity to meet demand. The recent EMA approval and upcoming launch of our multi-dose quick pen delivery device for Manjaro will unlock new supply capacity for Europe and other international markets. While we are also seeing meaningful progress in the ramp of new lines in existing Lilly and CDMO sites for the United States. We continue to make progress against our plans to increase manufacturing capacity, the most ambitious expansion plan in our company's history. Lastly, we distributed over $1 billion in dividends during the first quarter. On slide five, you'll see a list of the key events since our Q4 earnings call, including the milestones I mentioned earlier and several other important updates. So now let me turn the call over to Anat to review our Q1 financial results. Thanks, Dave. Slide six summarizes financial performance in the first quarter of 2024. First quarter revenue growth of 26% was driven by new products, primarily Montreal and Zepbound. Gross margin as a percent of revenue increased from 78.4% in Q1 2023 to 82.5% in Q1 2024. Gross margin in the quarter benefited from higher realized prices, 
variable product mix, and to a lesser extent, improved production cost. Marketing, sound, and administrative expenses increased 12%, primarily driven by promotional efforts supporting current and future launches, as well as increased compensation and benefit costs. R&D expenses increased 27%, driven by higher development expenses for late-stage assets and additional investments in early-stage research, as well as a one-time charge of approximately $75 million associated with the termination of the Verzenio Pro State Program. In Q1, we recognized the acquired IP R&D charge of $111 million, which negatively impacted EPS by 10 cents. Operating income increased 63% in Q1, driven by higher revenue from, net, from new products, partially offset by operating expense growth. Our Q1 effective tax rate was 11.9%, compared to 12.8 in Q1 2023, driven by a larger net discrete tax benefit reflected in Q1 2024, compared with the same period in 2023. We delivered earnings per share of $2.58 in Q1, a 59% increase compared to Q1 2023, inclusive of the negative impact of $0.10 cents from acquired IPR&D charges in both periods. On slide 7, we quantify the effect of price, rate, and volume on revenue growth. U.S. revenue increased 28% in Q1, driven by growth of Monjaro, Zetbound, and Verzenio. Unprecedented demand for incretin medicines led to wholesaler back orders of Trilicity, Monjaro, and Zetbound at quarter end. Realized prices in the U.S. increased 16%, largely driven by Monjaro excess and savings card dynamics. Moving to Europe, revenue growth was once again strong, increasing 29% in constant currency, driven primarily by volume from Verzenio and Monjaro, as well as payments associated with the distribution and divestiture agreements. Japan revenue grew 2% in constant currency. Volume growth of 7% was driven by Monjaro and Verzenio, partially offset by decreased volume for Trulicity and a partnership milestone in the base period. Price declined 5% in the quarter. Moving to China, Q1 revenue increased 4% in constant currency. Volume growth was driven by Tyvet, partially offset by Illumiant and Cialis. Revenue in the rest of the world increased 31% in constant currency primarily driven by volume growth from Manjaro, and to a lesser extent, Verzenio and Jardian. Slide 8 provides additional perspective across our product categories. First, I would like to highlight Verzenio, which saw worldwide sale increase 40% in Q1, driven by continued volume growth in the early breast cancer indication. J. Perka revenue increased to 50 million worldwide, representing an acceleration in sequential quarterly growth following the December 2023, 2023 approval for the CLO indication. We're looking forward to potentially making this medicine available to even more patients as future phase three trials read out. Next in Q1, Monjaro sales were $1.8 billion globally and $1.5 billion in the U.S., up from $568 million and $536 million in Q1 2023, respectively. Sequential quarter-over-quarter revenue for Monjaro in the U.S. was impacted by a one-time benefit from changes in estimates for release and discounts in Q4 2023, as well as lower inventory in the channel in Q4 2024 and its strong demand. Access level across commercial and Part D were consistent with high levels we communicated on our last earnings call and near parity with established injectable incretin medicines. The demand for trisepatite is very strong. In each week, hundreds of thousands of people fill scripts from Monjaro and Zepbound. Yet we understand the frustration from those facing prescription delays or uncertainties getting their medicine. While we are working tirelessly to ramp supply and expect meaningful increases in shipment volumes in the second half of the year, demand continues to outstrip even increased supply. We remain on track to meet expectations we set earlier this year. The production of saleable doses of incretin medicine in the second half of 2024 will be at least one and a half times the saleable doses in the second half of 2023. In the short to midterm, we expect sales growth to primarily be a function of the quantities we can produce and ship. Outside the U.S., we're delighted that the multi-dose quick pen delivery device from Monjaro was recently approved in the EU 
adding to the UK approval earlier this year. This approval applies to both the type 2 diabetes and chronic weight management indication as they are under the single brand in Europe. While timing for launch will vary by country, we expect to start launching in the EU in coming weeks. In Q1, worldwide Trulicity revenue declined 26%. U.S. Trulicity revenue decreased 30%, driven by lower volume, primarily due to supply constraints and competitive dynamics. In addition, sales in international markets were impacted by measures we have taken to minimize disruption to existing patients, including communicating to healthcare professionals to not start new patients on Trulicity. Turning to slide nine, we have seen exceptionally strong U.S. launch progress for ZepBound with over half a billion in sales in Q1. We're rapidly building out access for ZepBound in the U.S. And as of April 1st, we have approximately 67% access in the commercial segment. As a reminder, patients' access in this market is a two-step process, typically require individual employers to opt in to an anti-obesity medicine rider following PBM coverage. We are continuing to focus on broadening access both with PBMs and for employer opt-ins, and early progress is encouraging. On slide 10, we provide an update on capital allocation. Slide 11 shows updated 2024 financial guidance. Given the strength we're seeing in our business and projections for continued acceleration expected in the second half of the year, we're increasing our full year revenue outlook by $2 billion on the top and bottom ends of the range to be between $42.4 billion to $43.6 billion. This increase is primarily due to the strong performance of Manjaro and ZetBound and greater visibility and confidence into our production expansion for the remainder of 2024. With this update, year-over-year -year revenue growth for the company is now expected to be approximately 26% at the midpoint or approximately 35% for the core business which excludes the impact from global divestitures. Given the update to revenue guidance, we now expect the ratio of gross margin less OPEX divided by revenue to be in the range of 32 to 34% on a reported basis and 33 to 35% on a non-GAAP basis, representing further margin expansion. We are reaffirming guidance for other income and expense and tax rates, which now takes into consideration Q1 results. Based on these updates and inclusive of Q1 IPR and D charges of $0.10 cents per share, we now expect EPS to be in the range of $13.05 to $13.55 on a reported basis and $13.50 to $14 on a non-GAAP basis. Now I'll turn the call over to Dan to highlight progress in R&D. Thanks, Anad. Let me start with our exciting announcement from earlier this month. That was the positive phase three results from the Surmount OSA studies, which evaluated terzepatide for treatment of adults with obesity and moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, known as OSA. OSA is a sleep-related breathing disorder characterized by complete or partial collapse of the upper airway during sleep. OSA can have serious cardiometabolic complications, contributing to hypertension, coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and even type 2 diabetes. The need is significant. OSA impacts 80 million people in the U.S., with more than 20 million people suffering from moderate to severe OSA. We also know that a substantial majority, approximately 70% of people with OSA, also live with obesity. While there are pharmaceutical treatments for the excessive daytime sleepiness associated with OSA, terzepatide could potentially be the first pharmacological treatment for the underlying disease. As shown on slide 12, Surmount OSA was comprised of two separate trials run under one master protocol. Study one evaluated terzepatide in participants not currently on positive airway pressure or PAP therapy, while study two evaluated terzepatide in patients who had used PAP for at least three months prior to the study and planned to continue PAP therapy during the entire course of the trial. The total of 469 participants were enrolled across these studies. Each study randomized participants to either maximum tolerated dose approved for terzepatide, which could be 10 milligrams or 15 milligrams, or to placebo, and patients were followed on therapy for 52 weeks. On slide 13, we show the results of study one. For the efficacy estimate on mean apnea hypopnea index, or AHI, 
terzepatide led to a mean reduction of 27.4 events per hour compared to a mean AHI reduction of 4.8 events per hour for placebo. This difference was highly statistically significant. AHI baseline values were 52.9, and AHI was reduced by 55% in the terzepatide arm. We also saw a mean body weight reduction of 18.1% with terzepatide treatment, consistent with our expectations for the study. This was, of course, also statistically significant versus placebo. On slide 14, we show the results of study two. In this population, for the efficacy estermand, terzepatide led to a mean AHI reduction of 30.4 events per hour compared to a mean AHI reduction of 6.0 events per hour for placebo. The baseline AHI was 46.1 in the terzepatide arm, and mean AHI reduction was 62.8%. Again, we saw impressive weight loss with a mean body weight reduction of 20.1% from baseline. These results were also all highly statistically significant. In both studies, the overall safety profile was similar to previously reported surmount and surpass trials. The most commonly reported adverse events were gastrointestinal related and generally mild to moderate in severity, with the most commonly reported gastrointestinal adverse events for patients treated with terzepatide being diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and constipation. Prior to the study readout, we noted investor questions about what level of weight loss we would see, given several factors that were uniquely combined in the study of terzepatide. First, the primary aim of the study was not treatment of obesity. Second, that the population was approximately 70% males, in whom weight loss can be harder to achieve with incretin med medicines. Third, there was a particularly high baseline BMI in this population. And finally, the use of the 10 or 15 milligram maximum tolerated dose approach. We were therefore highly reassured to see weight loss observed across the two studies at 52 weeks was nearly 20%, despite this difficult to treat population. Consistent with other phase three studies such as Epitide at the 52-week time point, we did not see weight loss plateau. We'll present detailed results of Surmount OSA during a symposium at ADA on June 21st. Additionally, we plan to submit to the FDA and other global regulatory agencies beginning mid-year. Moving to the other updates across our portfolio, slide 15 shows select pipeline opportunities as of April 26, and slide 16 shows potential key events for the year. We're pleased to share that results were positive in QUINT4, the first phase three study of insulin Efsatora Alpha, our once-weekly basal insulin. This study evaluated Efsatora compared to insulin glargine in adult participants with type 2 diabetes who are on multiple daily insulin injections. In the coming weeks, we expect to report top-line results from QUINT4 as well as QUINT2, which is evaluating Efsatora compared to Degladec in adults with type 2 diabetes who are naive to basal insulin. Together, these are the first two of five studies in the Efsatora Phase three program. Additional updates in our late-stage diabetes and obesity pipeline include results of the MPACT-MI study, showing Jardiance had a 10% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint of time-to-first hospitalization due to heart failure or all-cause mortality versus placebo, which did not reach statistical significance. We've completed enrollment for surmount MMO, with over 15,000 participants, and for both Orford-Glipron studies in chronic weight management, ATTAIN-1 and ATTAIN-2, which together enrolled 4,500 participants. Finally, we've now initiated the Transcend Phase three program, studying retitrutide in type 2 diabetes. In the cardiovascular disease area, we're excited to have initiated the Phase three trial for lepidicerin, the subcutaneous injectable siRNA. This study will evaluate the efficacy in improving cardiovascular outcomes for participants with high lipoprotein A who have cardiovascular disease or are at a risk of heart attack or stroke. We are evaluating the efficacy of lepidicerin in both secondary and high-risk primary prevention, and we hope this will one day offer healthcare providers a treatment option for a broad group of patients at increased cardiovascular risk due to high LPA levels. Earlier in our diabetes and obesity pipeline, we've now initiated a phase two monotherapy study evaluating Allura lintide, our selective amylin receptor agonist in obesity. Turning to oncology, we made the decision to terminate for futility the phase three cyclone three trial evaluating Bresenio in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer following an interim analysis. 
This concludes development of Verzenio and prostate cancer following last quarter's announcement that the Cyclone 2 study did not meet its primary endpoint. In early oncology development, we've initiated phase one trials for two new assets. The first is our Nectin-4 ADC, which came from our acquisition of Emergence Therapeutics. The second is PNT-2001, which came from our acquisition of Point Biopharma. We're encouraged by what we're seeing in our oncology portfolio and expect 2024 to be particularly productive. Along with the Nectin-4 ADC and PNT-2001 start, we expect at least three other new molecules to enter the clinic this year. We look forward to sharing more details with the investment community at an oncology-focused investor event hosted by the Lilly Oncology team. This event will take place on the evening of Sunday, June 2nd in Chicago in conjunction with the ASCO annual meeting and will also be available via webcast. We plan to provide an update on our oncology strategy and pipeline opportunities. Additional details will be available soon regarding this event. Turning to neuroscience, last month we announced that the FDA plans to convene a meeting of the peripheral and CNS Drugs Advisory Committee to discuss denetumab in early symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. We expect the advisory committee meeting will take place in mid-2024, but the exact date will be confirmed when it appears in the Federal Register. We expect the focus to be around the safety and efficacy profile of denetumab, along with unique aspects of the clinical program. Remain confident in denetumab's potential to offer very meaningful benefits to patients and look forward to addressing the FDA's questions in this forum. Additionally, we made the decision to discontinue investigation of GBA-1, our gene therapy asset in Gaucher disease type 2. Phase 2 studies in Parkinson's disease and Gaucher disease type 1 are still underway and have not been impacted by this decision. Finally, in immunology, we've submitted mirakizumab to the FDA and EMA for approval for use in adults with moderately to severely active Crohn's disease. In the U.S., we've resubmitted lebrakizumab's application to the FDA for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. This is following a complete response letter based on inspection findings at a third-party manufacturer. As a reminder, the letter stated no concerns with the clinical data package safety or label. We expect regulatory action in the second half of this year. We're also announcing that in the coming months, we'll be initiating phase three studies evaluating lebrakizumab in two new indications, chronic rhinositis with nasal polyposis and allergic rhinitis due to perennial allergens. Lebrakizumab will be the first biologic to be evaluated in phase three for allergic rhinitis. We're optimistic about the potential of lebrakizumab to be an important treatment option in these patient populations, as well as in atopic dermatitis. In earlier stage immunology development, we've advanced our CD19 antibody into phase two for multiple sclerosis. I now turn the call back to Dave for closing remarks. Okay, thanks, Dan. Before we go to Q&A, let me briefly sum up the progress in our first quarter. Strong revenue growth in Q1 was driven by our recent product launches, primarily Manjaro and Kataka. We expect acceleration in revenue growth through the second half of the year as supply of incretin medicines continues to ramp. Significant advances in our pipeline include top-line data from Terzepatine and Surmount OSA, approval of the QuickPen delivery device from Manjaro in the EU, submission of Merikizumab and Lebrakizumab, as well as an initiation of Lepridisip Oh, Disseren, sorry, uh, phase three study, as Dan just mentioned. We are continuing to invest in recent and upcoming launches, internal and external pipeline development, and our manufacturing expansion agenda. This is to sustain our long-term growth outlook. So now let me turn the call over to Joe to moderate the Q&A session. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we'd like to take questions from as many callers as possible and to conclude our call in a timely manner. So consistent with prior quarters, We'll respond to one question per caller, so ask that you limit to one question per caller as we'll end the call at 11 a.m. If you have more than one question, you can re-enter the queue and we'll get to your question if time allows. So Paul, please provide instructions for the Q&A session and then we're ready for our first caller. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you have any questions, please press star one on your phone at this time. We ask that participants limit themselves to one question on today's call. If you do have a follow-up question, please rejoin the queue by pressing star 1 at any time. We also ask that while posing your question, you please pick up your handset if listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. Please hold while we poll for questions. And the first question today is coming from Chris Schott from JP Morgan. Chris, your line is live. 
Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much, and congrats on all the, the progress here. Um, I just had a question, just was hoping you could elaborate a bit more on the capacity dynamics that are leading to the guidance raised today. I specifically was just looking for a little more color of, is this more U.S. or international? And should we read this as more capacity in the system than you expected, or just a faster ramp of the new plant and, and maybe the same overall capacity as you exit the year? Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. I'll uh, hand over to Nav to talk about the guidance raise. Thanks for the question, Chris. And um, as, I, as we've mentioned earlier in the year when we issued guidance, uh, we said that the, we expect capacity and supply to ramp towards the second half of the year, and that's what we're seeing. Now, as a reminder, we do have quite a large number of nodes across our supply chain that have to come online or ramp capacity. You know, we are, if you look at everything we're, uh, we have under construction or ramping up, we have six sites right now between the two sites in North Carolina, a site in Ireland, two sites in Indiana, a site in Germany, and then a seventh one that we just purchased. They're all either ramping up or under construction. And there are multiple nodes across that supply chain that have to become uh, operational, which requires approval, et cetera, for three products, depending on which product runs on which line, um, that are planned throughout the year. Now, now that we're four months into the year, we have greater visibility into, that, uh, into these nodes of capacity and feel more confident. Just as one example, the approval of the quick pen in Europe that just came in, slightly ahead of our expectation, gives us additional confidence in our ability to launch quick pen for patients in Europe. So it is across our sites globally, as well as ramping up capacity with uh, partners, our CDMOs, as well as in existing sites where we're making investments to expand where we can or ramp up capacity. So it's, uh, it's across our supply chain. Thanks. Next caller, Paul. Thank you. The next question is coming from Mohit Pansal from Wells Fargo. Mohit, your line is live. Great. Thank you very much for taking my question and congrats on the progress. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the pricing. So if you look at the the script trend, uh, it seems like there was a little bit of adverse relationship uh, in the pricing versus fourth quarter. Can you comment on that? And how should we think about the cadence of price volume over the quarter for the year? Thank you. Thanks, Mohit. Um, you didn't say it, but I assume you're talking about Manjaro and, uh, and ZetBound. So I'll hand over to uh, Patrick to make some commentary on, on that price. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mohit. When you look at the pricing of Manjaro, I think it's important to take into account that in the Q4 earnings, we announced a one-time adjustment for Monjaro in Q4 that was quite significant. So that was a one-time adjustment in the base of Q4. When we look forward for the first half of 2024, uh, it's important to have in mind that we also terminated the $25 saving card 6-30-2023, but patients that were on are grandfathered until 6.30-2024. So that would probably be some benefits during the first half of 2024 for, for Monjaro. But from the second half of this year, we should expect to see typical pricing headwinds for Monjaro as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, Paul. Thanks. The next question is coming from Umar Rafat from Evercore. Umar, your line is live. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I wanted to focus a quick second on Part D reimbursement dynamics, if I may. And my question is, will terzepatide be considered differently than a quote-unquote weight loss drug to secure Part D reimbursement? And the new indications like sleep apnea, will they be considered an applicable drug and not get lumped up as a broad weight loss drug, quote-unquote? Thank you. Thanks, Umar. I'll go to Patrick for that question. Thank you very much, Umar. Uh, I think with the announcement made by the CMS uh, early April to uh, reimburse comorbidities for, uh, for obesity based upon the SELECT trial, we're also confident that with the new data that we presented just weeks ago in terms of obstructive sleep apnea, that that's going to be uh, reimbursed in, in Medicare Part E. And we expect similarly for uh, other comorbidities and the readout of HEFPEF, assuming that's positive and approved, and later on with the mobility mortality outcome study. Still, our true north is really to get the TROA, the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, passed. And we strongly believe that's not a matter of if, but when. We don't see it likely to pass in 2024, but there is still a small, like, small likelihood that that's going to happen. Thanks, Patrick. Next question, Paul. 
Thank you. The next question is coming from Seamus Fernandez from Guggenheim. Seamus, your line is live. Great. Thanks for the question. So um, really just wanted to ask, uh, Dan, uh, as you have assessed the phase two uh, surmount uh, data in NASH, uh, just interested to know how you are thinking about uh, those data and the opportunity for terzepatide uh, in that setting, or perhaps if retitrutide um, remains the, uh, the, the right target molecule to move forward there. Um, we've had a lot of speculation around uh, some of the comments from the last quarter and just trying to firm that up uh, and also when we're likely to see those data, I believe they're expected at easel, but uh, if that is possible to confirm, thanks so much. Dan? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Seamus. I'll, I'll start with the last part there. Yeah, the uh, AppSec was ex uh, accepted and uh, will be presented at EASL in uh, early June. Uh, so that, that'll be the opportunity to see the, the full uh, NASH package uh, from that phase two trial. Uh, like we said uh, in the last call, you know, really exciting data. We, we shared some of the top line. Um, I, I think terzepatide can have a profound uh, effect on this disease. It's a phase two trial. Next steps here are to discuss with the FDA what the best path forward uh, could be for trisepatide. You're, you're pointing out, uh, though, that we, we have another choice in, in retitrutide, uh, which, based on biomarker data from earlier studies, could also have a profound effect on this disease. That molecule has the addition of glucagon, um, which is likely to have additional benefits in the liver. So important uh, uh, opportunities ahead and, and good to have options uh, as we go into these uh, discussions with, with regulators. I think for MASH, uh, like other obesity-related uh, or metabolic-related um, uh, diseases, uh, Lily has a, a, a pretty broad portfolio and, and will just continue to push the science to make the best possible medicines for patients. Thanks, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question will be from Tim Anderson from Wolf Research. Tim, your line is live. Well, thank you. Uh, you showed a slide that Bound has in BRX share market of 57% at end of Q1. That makes it pretty clear that the strongest drug wins. So on that topic, uh, just your latest thinking on upcoming competitor readouts and how they'll stack up to ZetBound on metrics of weight loss and blood sugar, so specifically Cagrisema from Novo and Amgen's 133. I know it's just the best guess, but it's what uh, we get asked to do. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, I'll maybe hand to Dan for some comments. Yeah, sure, Tim. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, more your job than ours to speculate on competitor readouts. Um, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it since, as you asked. I, I think on, you know, AMG 133, we, we've just seen really a small amount of data, so probably anything is possible. And uh, like you, will be interested to see their their results. But, you know, of course, there's arguments that uh, can be heard about GIP agonism versus antagonism. We've placed our bets, and, and we like the data we got with, with GIP agonism. Um, on, on Cagrisema, you know, of, of course, adding more, um, the agonism on, on different pathways on top of GLP-1 is a good idea. That's what we have with terzepatide as a dual agonist. So uh, Cagrisema makes sense, and, and you'll note that uh, we've advanced our, our amylin uh, agonist into phase two. Terzepatide already is a dual agonist. Ratatrutide is already a triple agonist. There's probably more we could do here at Lilly. I think uh, across our portfolio, in phase one and phase two, we have nine assets that are marked for diabetes or obesity. Many of them could, could lead to uh, additive weight loss on top of established mechanisms, plus two more in, in phase three, of course. So we have a strong portfolio here. I think terzepatide still has unsurpassed uh, efficacy at, at weight loss, um, but we're preparing for our next generation assets as well. Thanks again, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question will be from Terence Flynn from Morgan Stanley. Terence, your line is live. Great. Uh, congrats on all the progress. Uh, just was wondering if you can tell us if the IQVIA prescription data is an accurate representation of terzepatide volumes or if it's been underrepresented at all given Lily Direct and what you know about how much is flowing through that channel. And if it is underrepresented, can you help quantify any delta for us? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Terrence. I'll hand to Patrick for commentary on 
uh, QVN will be direct. Well, thank you very much, Terence. Uh, you know, when it comes to Lily Direct, I think we are very pleased with the start. And uh, when we look at the utilization by consumers, it's gaining traction by weeks here. Uh, if we look at the TRX data for Q1, particularly for Zepbound, it's relatively low uh, volume that goes through Lily Direct, slightly higher in terms of MBRX. Uh, it's our understanding that what goes through Lily Direct is not uh, by default captured by IQVIA, but IQVIA has a methodology in place to estimate what goes through Lily Direct as well. Thank you, Patrick. All next question. The next question will be from Akash Tiwari from Jefferies. Akash, your line is live. Hey, thanks so much. So your team presented data on a monotherapy gift agonist at ADA last year, but it looks like you are moving the amylin into phase two. Can you talk about why amylin might be preferred versus GIP as a maintenance regimen for obesity and how your product could defer versus others when it comes to half-life and preferential agonism versus calcitonin and amylin? Thanks. Thank you, Akash. Uh, I'll hand to Dan for commentary on um, our amylin. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of good questions in there. Thank, thanks for following the science so closely. So on, on the GIP, uh, the long-acting molecule, I think uh, primarily in that experiment, we were excited to show the benefits of isolated GIP agonism, just to answer some mechanism action questions around terzepatide. But as you point out, there's potential for that molecule uh, for, you know, the other other indications or as a monotherapy or combination with other uh, uh, mechanisms. But, uh, of course, since terzepatide already includes GIP agonism, uh, we're also excited to explore other mechanisms. So that's where the LARA, which is uh, one of uh, nine different mechanisms, as I said uh, a moment ago, um, that we're exploring the long-acting amylin move, move forward to phase two. Uh, that has potential perhaps as a combination therapy, perhaps as a maintenance therapy, perhaps as a monotherapy. There's a lot to explore. It's still very early uh, as it is for, for all of our mechanisms. So we'll, we'll keep investing, and uh, as we have data to share, we'll, we'll do that. Thanks, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question will be from Trung Huyn from UBS. Trung, your line is live. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for my question. Just back on CMS recently broadening its coverage for Wagovi for certain heart conditions. I appreciate you mentioned that Troa is the main goal, but do you expect Zep bound to get added to CMS in a similar way as Wagovi? Um, and yeah, when when could this happen? Could this be after the heart failure data in 3Q or do we have to wait for the CVOT data? Thanks very much. Thanks, Trung. I'll let uh, Patrick respond. Thanks, Ram. Uh, no, based upon what CMS stated early April, we actually expect to get uh, obstructive sleep apnea for CEPAM covered by, uh, by CMS and Medicare at the time of launch. Uh, and the next one then would be HEPPEF, assuming a positive readout and approval. And the third one would be the MMO indication. Uh, that's the sequence of, uh, of our plans, assuming everything goes according to plan and we get the approval for both. Thanks, Patrick. Paul, next question. The next question will be from Jeff Meacham from Bank of America. Jeff, your line is live. Morning, guys. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, you guys have been asked on this before, I'm sure, but can you just review the rationale in, in use, utilizing the quick pen just for outside the U.S. markets like Europe? I wasn't sure, you know, why this couldn't apply to the U.S. market and, and if this also could be a means to, to relieve capacity looking forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. Paul? Dave, want to weigh in? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, and Ilya can add to this. Um, as we think, of, as we've said on several calls now, our goal is to pursue all of the above, basically as it relates to supply options, recognizing the tremendous demand and unmet need um, and the constraints that exist in scaling the supply chain. So QuickBen uses um, you know, existing assets, so there was less time lag. Um, we uh, pursued this um, you know, first in the UK and now in Europe as a way to, to meet the needs of those patients. Uh, but we haven't ruled it out in other jurisdictions. Um, and so we'll continue to look at every option we can to, to meet um, the needs of patients uh, with obesity and overweight, as well as with diabetes. Thanks, Dave. Paul, next question. The next question is from Kerry Halford from Berenberg. Kerry, your line is live. Oh, hi. Um... I'm going to take a different 
topic here. Um, looking at LP little a, um, your new product you've now said that you're taking into phase three. Can you confirm whether you've published any phase two data? I haven't found any. So if if I'm correct there, when might we see that published? And can you confirm what dose and frequency of administration you're looking at for that phase three study? And I guess as you appear to be positioned third in that race, we'd be interested to hear how you expect your drug to be differentiated versus a competitor as there's already in phase three. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. So good multi-part question, but on LP little a, happy to talk about lepidusaran. Um, so Dan, you want to comment on this? Yeah, th thanks, Carrie, for the, the good questions here. You're right, we haven't uh, yet uh, published the phase two data. I think we just recently uh, were able to, to publish the phase one data. And, uh, that, that was really exciting and well received. I think one of the things that people noted in our phase one data was a very long durability of action and the very deep uh, reduction in LP little a uh, levels uh, following a, a single dose of, of lepidisrin. Um, we now have, uh, of course, uh, a phase two data in hand and uh, use that to design and begin the phase three trial. I think we uh, haven't quite uh, disclosed uh, dose or frequency yet, but uh, I'm sure that will happen in, in time. You asked about differentiation. I think there's probably a, a couple different potentials for differentiation here. Um, versus uh, a shorter-acting ASO and a, uh, a siRNA that are both in, in phase three studies. Maybe first is um, the the depth of clearance of LP little a. We don't know how much you have to reduce LP little a to lead to benefits in cardiovascular outcomes, and and whether there's a, a, a threshold effect or or a, a floor to to this. So the depth of of clearance is one. The, the second, uh, as you asked about, could be frequency of administration or durability of action, uh, those two being closely linked. And the third, of course, is the population that's being studied. And uh, I noted we're studying secondary as well as primary prevention here. So I, I think we have a good package with multiple opportunities for differentiation and eager to test the uh, LPA hypothesis here in this phase three study. Thanks for the question, Carrie. Paul, next question. Next question will be from Steve Scala from TD Cowan. Steve, your line is live. Oh, thank you very much. Given that, based on all available metrics, the surpassed CVOT interim likely already has passed, can you confirm that the only way the trial would have stopped is if there were either a survival benefit or futility and not simply non-inferiority? And anything you can say regarding your confidence in eventually hitting superiority based on what you know so far. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Dan, you want to take a question on surpass CVOT? Sure. Uh, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, as you know, we, we do our best not to comment on interim analyses, although many of our different trials can incorporate uh, interim analyses. But uh, when we do talk about them, it risks uh, unintentional uh, unblinding of, of results. And uh, uh, for that reason, we, we prefer not to do that. You're right that the primary analysis of the study and the design was around uh, non-inferiority versus what we are ready to know to be a very good drug that reduces uh, cardiovascular risk, and that's Trulicity. Um, so it's uh, um, uh, designed as a non-inferiority trial. Of course, when, when the final data come, we, we would uh, be delighted to see uh, even superiority. You asked about our confidence. Uh, confidence continues to increase for this uh, readout. Uh, in fact, uh, as uh, disclosed in the prepared remarks today, um, we got additional data here even from the OSA study that should make us feel more confident, uh, not just the benefit in sleep apnea, uh, which itself uh, could lead to cardiovascular benefits, but actually the weight loss. And uh, I think there, there are some concerns about weight loss in different populations and different trials and uh, males, females, et cetera. So uh, some of that was, was discharged here. So remain excited and, and look forward to getting that data when studies complete. Thanks, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question will be from Evan Siegerman from BMO Capital Markets. Evan, your line is live. Hi, all. Thank you so much for taking my question. I wanted to touch on the Nanomab, you know, with the ADCOM approaching. Can you discuss how your comp if your confidence has changed in the asset 
and maybe any specific points that you will hope will be addressed during um, this discussion with these outside experts. Thank you so much. Thanks, Evan. Anne, we're going to discuss with Donna Adcom. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. And we are incredibly confident in uh, Vanamab's potential and, and the fact that it offers very meaningful benefits to people with uh, early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and just the overall approvability of the package. We do look forward to seeing those questions. We haven't received those yet. I think that um, what we'll anticipate really is uh, discussions around the safety and efficacy of Denanumab. And uh, those, the safety and efficacy profile remain very consistent with what we published and presented. So, uh, so nothing new there. We do expect there's a couple of unique aspects to our trial that we anticipate they'll want to discuss. One is around uh, limited duration dosing. We think this is an incredibly important feature of denanumab, the chance to stop dosing when you've cleared the plaques. And, and denanumab clears them robustly and rapidly. So we think that allows for this limited duration dosing approach. So we really do look forward to getting into that data and having uh, the advisors see that and, and respond to it. Another unique aspect is assessing tau at baseline. Uh, this is important for the field so that we understand the prognostic factor of tau, and that was able to be confirmed. But what we saw in the trial was all patients benefited, regardless of tau level, uh, with those earlier in the disease doing even better. It's one of the reasons that we remain so enthusiastic about Trailblazer 3. And while Dan didn't mention that in his remarks, uh, I think we're, we remain and, and get even more enthusiastic about the opportunity to intervene earlier based on what we saw in that early population, the people with low uh, tau and those that had no tau with such strong biomarker results. I think you probably remember the data that uh, patients in that earliest part of our study had a 60% slowing. And we believe that could be even stronger as you get into the, the uh, earlier patients that are preclinical. But maybe just one remark. In the meantime, though, this is not time lost. We'll continue to make sure the healthcare system is ready. We're going to make sure that we launch into an even stronger market uh, with potential approval. Uh, so we're making the most of this time and look forward to that, Adcom, as Dan said, in mid-24 and answering any questions that they have. Thank you, Anne. Paul, next question. The next question will be from David Reisinger from Learing Partners. David, your line is live. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and let me add my congrats on the progress and the guidance raised. So um, my question is on Orphoglipron. Novo Nordisk has raised some concerns about the scalability of orphogliprone manufacturing given its complexity. I haven't spoken to Novo directly, but someone told me that they mentioned there are 35 steps in the process. I don't know if that's true, but could you please discuss how Lilly is building out its manufacturing capacity and whether the company expects to be able to meet global demand in the Western world after launch in 2026, or whether we, the investment community, should expect supply constraints and should be guarded about how we try to model or for Glipron's ramp after launch. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I'll uh, hand over to our Dave Ricks here. Okay, great, Dave. Great to hear from you. Um, I mean, first of all, it is true that orforbipron is a complicated, large, uh, small molecule, a large, small molecule, if you were, and there are many steps in the process. You can read about them in our patent filings, I think. Um, but, you know, Lilly, uh, maybe unlike other companies, we've made small molecules for a long time. Um, we're capable of doing it. We understand how to put them together, and we've got a defined process to do it uh, for orforbipron. Um, so the API production well, a long process um, and maybe complicated relative to other small molecules is something we're super confident in and have our arms around. Um, the the finished process is really the big advance over using injectables because here we're just tablet stamping or tablet uh, capsule making, um, which are you know dry processes we understand extremely well. Um, I think the big gain here will be the fact that both for synthetic chemistry and uh, capsule making and tablet making, there is already capacity on planet Earth that, that is significant. And so unlike the parenteral side where we've been talking about injectables and new capacity needs to be built, and which we're doing aggressively as I not commented on earlier, um, here there's a lot of partners we can access as well as our own substantial network for uh, dry product co-finish and API production. So. Uh, Pretty confident here. Now, will we will we stick the landing on exact doses and quantities in every instance? We're not guaranteeing that, but I think the picture will be quite a bit different. Um, should 
Orgopon proved to be safe and effective in the phase three studies. Um, again, that's in 25, so we can expect launch maybe a year after that, and um, that, that's an important event in the time course of the Pinkerton uh, class. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Dave Reisinger, for the question. Um, next question, Paul. Next question is coming from Louise Chen from Cantor. Louise, your line is live. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I just wanted to ask you about your next wave of obesity drugs. Looks like you've got half a dozen of these in development, and where do you think you can most differentiate yourself? Thank you. Thanks. Dan, you want to comment on earlier phase obesity? Yeah, thanks, Louise. We're excited about the portfolio of earlier stage uh, obesity molecules. I think there's a, a number of opportunities for improvement uh, over even a, an excellent drug like terzepatide. Um, we think about the quality of weight loss as, as one aspect. So, for example, uh, even on terzepatide, we see the, the ratio of lean to fat mass improve as patients uh, are, lose weight on these drugs. Could we make it improve even faster with a muscle stimulating agent like uh, bimagramab? Maybe that's, that's under investigation. Um, Terzepatide is, is very well tolerated, but some people stop taking it because of GI side effects. Could we have drugs that have fewer side effects? That maybe that could be possible. Uh, Terzepatide is given as a once a weekly injection. Most patients uh, uh, find that to be acceptable, but uh, probably with um, the less frequent uh, injections that could lower the burden on manufacturing and uh, make, it, make it easier to use for patients. So that's another avenue of exploration. Uh, there are some patients who don't achieve their desired levels of weight loss, uh, even on a, a powerful drug like terzepatide, and so uh, that's another avenue. Um, finally, across different indications, and I spoke earlier of MASH um, that are related to metabolic disease, there could be different activities that proved more or less beneficial for these other related uh, uh, diseases. So um, uh, that's another avenue of differentiation. I think we're we're just at the beginning of uh, probably what, what will be seen as a multi-decade uh, investment in treating abnormal metabolism and all the diseases that come with that. And uh, I'm really uh, proud and, and pleased uh, that really has what, what must be the strongest pipeline in this area in, in the industry. Thank you, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question is from Chris Shibutani from Goldman Sachs. Chris, your line is live. Hey, okay, thanks, Chris. Chris. Paul, next question. Oops, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there you are. Go ahead, Great, Chris. thank you. Wanted to ask about the supply and dynamic uh, and the demand and when those two might come closer together. Previously, Anat, you've been quite specific in your vocabulary in saying that that was something that could possibly happen in 2025. Uh, Dave, you were uh, in front of a group uh, that we hosted, and I think you gave a little bit of a broader range. What's the latest that you would like to communicate based upon all the progress that you're making, the acquisition of the Wisconsin facility, et cetera, uh, about a potential timing for that supply demand dynamic to come closer together? And Chris, I'm not. Yep. Yeah, um, let me start on, on this. So I would say that, as I said in my prepared remark, we expect that the supply demand situation will remain quite tight in the near term as well as the midterm. And just to clarify, it's not that we have a production issue or manufacturing facilities are progressing incredibly well. And I'm incredibly proud of the work done by our M&Q colleagues around the world. Literally, we have sites working 24-7. We're doing construction overnight. We're making the right investments to ensure we're progressing rapidly, as you've seen evidenced by the results as well as the raise we did for the year. But the demand is strong, which shouldn't be a surprise given the health benefits of these products provide to patients highly efficacious and safe medicines. And I expect that this will continue through the year, even with the significant ramp that we have, and we'll add more supply uh, in, across different presentations, both with the auto injector as well as the quick pen. But even with that, I expect that the demand will be, will outpace supply through this year. Potentially next year, obviously we'll see, we'll, we'll continue to invest in ramp um, as we go into next year. But it could be quite some time. We talked earlier about orphagliprone. Should we have positive phase three readout that provides another relief valve in terms of just offering a different presentation, as Dave mentioned, which utilizes a different um, set of infrastructure within our manufacturing organization, available capacity globally. So it will be in a, state, in a stepwise fashion. We'll continue to update 
um, investors as, as we progress through the year and, and coming years. Thanks for that. Paul, next question. Next question will be from Carter Gould from Barclays. Carter, your line is live. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning. Congrats on all the progress. I wanted to uh, dive into Bimagramab uh, ahead of the Phase 2B uh, data forthcoming. And can you talk for uh, a bit around the importance of showing StatSig or clear dose resp response across the composition of the, the, the weight loss drivers and maybe uh, as well as um, the importance of not blunting the, 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 the overall weight loss as you contemplate a move to Phase 3 potentially? Thank you. Thanks, Carter, for the question. Dan, you want to comment on bimagramab? Yeah, th thanks, Carter. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, bimagramab is a very different uh, mechanism of uh, weight loss versus uh, incretins, um, but one that we think could be important in combination with incretins. So uh, bimagramab, uh, uh, you know, we, we think will, will likely have important effects on um, adipose tissue as well as uh, muscle mass. And so our hope is to see increased uh, uh, muscle mass um, and increased increased ratio, I should say, of, of lean to fat mass uh, by combining bimagramab with uh, incretins. In, in this present study, it's being evaluated both as monotherapy and combination with semaglutide um, at different doses. So we'll see if weight loss um, effects on, on fat tissue stack, and we'll see if effects on lean body mass that were seen in previous bimagramab monotherapy studies um, work in combination with, with incretin. Looking forward to seeing that too. Thanks, Dan. Paul, next question. The next question is coming from Kripa Devarakonda from Truist Securities. Kripa, your line is live. Hey guys, thank you so much for taking my question and congrats on all the progress. Um, I have a question about your radio pharma Pipeline. You mentioned PNT2002 in your oncology pipeline. Can you talk about how you see that advancing and given what you've seen so far, where you see this being placed in the landscape in terms of market share? Thank you. Um, thanks, Griva, for the, for the question. Jake, I'm calling you to maybe opine a little bit on our, our radio, uh, radio ligand efforts, PNT2001 in particular. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for the question. Um, we're really excited about bringing radio pharmaceuticals into the portfolio by way of the acquisition of Point Biopharma, and, and we are su supplementing that acquisition uh, with additional work through our discovery labs and the ability to make these medicines ourselves. Um, so I, I expect we'll have more to talk about in terms of additional medicines over the course of the next couple of years, in addition to TNT 2001. But specific to that question, 2001 is a PSMA-directed therapy for prostate cancer conjugated to actinium, the alpha emitter. And I think, you know, while there, actinium holds a lot of promise uh, over lutetium, particularly in the context of creating double-stranded DNA breaks versus single-stranded and the ability to perhaps drive more efficacy for patients with prostate cancer, I think one of the limitations of the existing agents is that um, they probably cause too much salivary gland toxicity to be real durable products. And so the, the point team de designed a novel PSMA directed ligand with increased tumor uptake relative to the salivary gland in order to drive more therapeutic index using actinium as the payload. So we're, we're just getting started with the phase one experience uh, right now. So I don't have a lot to say about you know, what we're seeing just yet. Uh, but the preclinical package looked really interesting and, and differentiated from the other PSMA ligands that exist out there. So we're looking forward to putting it through its phase one paces, and, and we'll see what we have. You know, depending on the clinical profile, you know, I think there's the potential to improve outcomes in patients that have already seen a lutetium-based agent, um, maybe go ahead of that and, and compete with the lutetium-based agents, or perhaps even go even earlier in therapy um, as uh, PSMA expression really exists in the continuum of prostate cancer care. So more to come on that as we define the clinical profile in the phase one. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Paul, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. We're right at 11, so maybe final question in the queue. Okay, the final question today is coming from James Shin from Deutsche Bank. James, your line is live. Yeah, good morning, guys. Thanks for the question. Uh, I just wanted to try and reconcile the guidance list with the one and a half times saleable doses being maintained. Thank you. 
Um, okay, James, maybe I'll give to now to talk about the, the guidance and how the guidance raised uh, it relates to the one and a half yeah, and so, dose comment. So let's start with the one and a half dose, saleable dose comment that I made on the guidance call in February. So that ref references not a number of devices, but number of saleable doses. And as we ramp up capacity for quick pen, Recall that unlike the single-use vial or the auto-injector, that quick pen is a multi-dose device that has multiple doses available for patients. Um, that comment referred to the second half of this year versus the second half of last year. So we're expecting that total saleable doses this year in the second half will be at least one and a half times where we were uh, second half of last year. That remains unchanged. But the level of confidence we have in our ability to, to uh, progress on each node of our capacity that's coming online or will get approved, et cetera, has just increased. There are multiple of these throughout the year. Multiple of these have occurred. Some will occur, as I gave the quick pen as one example. Uh, think about a construction of a site, uh, for example, Concord in North Carolina, which we said will become operation by end of the year and we'll start seeing products next year. That construction has concluded, lines are installed, and we need to run qualifications, get approval, et cetera. There are multiple nodes of these across our own manufacturing sites as well as external, and that they all need to come online um, to, to get to where we need in terms of the full year guidance. But our confidence as the year progresses, uh, and as the year has progressed, our confidence in that has, uh, has increased, but it remains the, the one, at least one and a half. Thanks, Anand. Great. Well, uh, thanks for your time today, everyone, and we appreciate you participating in today's earnings call and your interest in our company. Please follow up with the IR team if you have any additional questions uh, that we didn't address today, and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude our conference for today. This conference will be made available for replay beginning at 1 p.m. today, running through June 4th at midnight. You may access the replay system at any time by dialing 800-332-6854 and entering the access code 317-750. International dialers can call 973-528-0005. Again, those numbers are 800-332-6854 and 973-528-0005 with the access code 317-750. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines.